So uh, today we have Mr. Devin here who will be walking us through. <laughs> Wait, this, this, this deserves it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who will be teaching us, yes, pro tips uh, on uh, maybe things that we don't know about how to do on Figma. So Devin, maybe like introduce yourself first and then we'll go into the presentation. Yeah, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna start recording my end now too, so I can give it to Eric, okay. our beautiful editor, to edit together later. Nice. Okay. Uh, my my recording should also have shortcuts, I believe, whenever I press something. That's, yeah, it does. So you'll be able to see what I press. Um, <clears throat> so my introduction is actually in my slideshow. It's about 79 slides. <laughs> they asked me to do it a couple days ago. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna put together a little something for you guys because I love you guys. And I want I want I want to have a little fun. You know, I don't want this to be 100% free form, where I'm like, kind of putting around Figma and you guys are like, what, what's he doing? Yeah. I don't even know. So Ooh, full if you don't style. mind, uh, I'm, I'm going to get into it. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, uh, well, thanks. Thanks for joining. Uh, I really appreciate it. This is sort of a last minute thing. And um, I like to think that I'm pretty good at Figma, maybe even great. Um, I'm not, you know, proclaiming to be the best designer in the world. Um, but I'm certainly not the worst, and I will say I am I am very fast, um, and I want to talk about how to how to make good decisions and how to become fast in Figma as well. So, this is my presentation: moving fast in Figma, uh, Devin Fountain presentation, or uh, too fast to Figma, uh, if <laughs> if you prefer. Nice. <clears throat> so first of all, um, I want to talk about who I am. Uh, give you a little bit of intro of 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 me and, and where I've been and, and what I do now. So first of all, that's me on the left. I'm a designer. Um, I am also a no code designer, builder, whatever. That's my girlfriend on the right. Um, she's also sometimes my copywriter. So I kind of struck it, struck it out. Um, and then my, my beautiful dog, our, our daughter, uh, she was birthed, you know, a couple of years ago. She's beautiful. She's perfect. But that's pretty much what my office looks like every single day is those three in here as I'm working. So Question. What, yeah. what were you eating? What, what was I eating? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is a poke bowl. Uh, this is in San Francisco when I lived there. Nice. Um, so I got my start as a designer at an agency in, um, I think I want to say 2014 as a product designer. And they took a shot on me. Um, they they gave me a chance as like a young junior designer to to sort of uh see if i i could make it in the world basically and i really appreciate that that's actually my creative director um brian benitez <clears throat> and then myself in a really awkward strange pose in our very cool office so <clears throat> sorry i got a bit, bit of a dry throat here so anyways as i was working through collective ray which is the name of that agency um something kept happening. I was working on designs and I was taking a long time to do each one. And every single time I would deliver to a client, they would say something like, yeah, this is, you know, this is good. It's maybe not quite what I was looking for. Like what else is there? Right. They would always ask if there's like an alternative. So eventually there was this conversation that came up where uh, my creative director said something like, yeah, he's decent, but he's, he's slow. And then the other guy, he's the other half of the agency. Like, yeah, he is good, but he's slow. And, they were basically like, you know, he should move faster than this or he's fired as hell, bro. So my creative director had a conversation with me where he basically said, listen, so I think that you're not very fast. I think that you're pretty good. But the problem is when you're making something pretty good, the client doesn't have alternatives to choose from. And so you need to become faster before you can become better. And then with that, it'll sort of carry over. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. So... This um, is actually a, a photo that I look back on a lot. This is in a hotel room in, here in New York City. This is actually before I lived here, where we had a client engagement. And in the meeting, I verbally agreed to something that Moss and his co-founder didn't agree to. And so this is me very frustrated at about midnight, um, trying to finish something up. And again, I'm not fast in this moment. I haven't gotten fast yet. So this is us being very frustrated and him taking a selfie as a sort of fuck you. You know what I mean? 
Um, I did quite a bit of work there. This isn't even all of it. Just like an example of like some of my early stuff. Like I've done uh, an entire Android OS. I've done whole Android apps, iPhone apps, online dashboards, some weird experimental apps within our own agency. Uh, you can actually see here, this is like a screenshot of some pixel art I did for the very first Apple Watch game to be released. Uh, that nice. was actually our agency. Uh, I did, I've done bus ads. I even did an illustration for Teespring once. And so then I started to get better and better, faster and faster, and started to make making more interfaces. And they pulled me on to do whole websites, uh, whole applications. And so, you know, remind you, this is in 2014, 2015. So we were still using Photoshop back then, sometimes uh, sometimes Sketch as it was brand new then. We didn't really know about Figma by this point. Um, here's me with our group at the second agency I was at. So this agency was a little more uh, a little more focused on like the process. And so after I had kind of gotten um, gotten a lot quicker with a lot of the programs, then I got to focus on some of the process behind the scenes. And I was able to apply that speed um, to some designs. And so you can kind of see that here, like a really atypical photo of a person in front of a whiteboard doing like sticky notes. Who, who cares about that stuff? <laughs> you don't need to do that stuff, honestly. Like this application that we worked on was very complicated but for most websites. You don't need that, but it's a great shot for your portfolio if you ever want it. Here's one of the apps that I worked on actually for that. So you can kind of see like um, a lot of this stuff is sort of cleaned up as I got better and better. Um, and then one small claim to fame, this is literally the only screenshot I found, but um, I actually designed the WikiHow homepage a long time ago, and it's oh, very nearly nice. identical to how it still is. Nice. Um, then after that, I, I went to Zeusk. This is like a fake gallery image. But uh, at Zeusk, which is a dating app, I designed the whole design system. And I wanted to make something there that other designers could use to also you know, sort of take pieces and, and get faster and faster. And so this taught me um, what, what the important parts were when you were actually making something. And then finally, I was at Jumbo Privacy uh, after that, where I worked on primarily one single app. I did the entire design system and iconography there, some of the illustrations and things like that. And now I quit my job in December and I get to design websites that I really enjoy. Designs that are featured yeah. on website galleries like Fido Stores. This is for um, a client that used to actually be a friend of mine. Uh, Tidal Locks, which... Uh, it's like a, you know, a really cool lock website. I built this one in a single day, which is like a, a cool little brag point. Uh, this is an agency website. Oh, you did that website. Copywriting website. This one? So beautiful. No, the, oh, the other I one. love your girlfriend's Yeah, website. this yeah, one. This is, yeah, I designed oh, yeah. it. I built yeah, this Yeah, I remember one. seeing yeah. this. It's amazing. That yeah. one is so and cute. I, this is like total like Brianna style. I feel yeah. like Brie would design this. Yeah. So this is designed uh, awesome. and built by me as well. This is actually the very first thing I built in Webflow for fun. I wanted to kind of see what I could do with like a ton of Lottie animations and interactions. So if you ever get the chance nice. to visit this, it's a, it's a fun time. The engagement's really high and you could see why. And then just more recently, the, the just, link for us on the chat. Uh, I would have to uh, just if you could put um, Molly Stubbs dot com. Yeah. 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 Leave it to me. I'm, yeah. I'm full screen in Figma. Yeah. I have so, the link. Nice. Uh, so then, you know, this is like a recent website I'm working on. Uh, also for a close friend of mine, this is something that I put one hour into um, and we're already going to start building it. But really, you know, who cares about me? Let's talk about fast stuff. So I want to talk about what isn't fast and then I want to talk about what is fast. Obviously, these bullet points are here and, and I'm going to read them, but what isn't fast is probably you. If you're here right now and you're watching this, we're either friends or you're probably not as fast <laughs> as you want to be or think you are. I think also what isn't fast is ignoring constraints of any sort. Um, Diego talks about this in his more recent video, but setting limits for yourself is really important. Uh, spending hours and hours designing a single button, that's not fast. That's a waste of time and that's a waste of your money. Clicking everything, also not fast. That's slow as hell. And I'm going to break down why that's really slow. And then over promising and under delivering. That's like a classic that kind of goes back to, you know, when I was at my first agency and I would promise things to the clients and I would give them one single iteration rather than alternatives. And that, that also applies down here where I say, you know, one really good alteration. Oops, the client really hates it. So what is fast? Let's, let's identify that. I got a nice little meme here. Um, first of all, hotkeys are fast. 
over delivering and under promising a little bit different, even better would be over delivering and over promising, giving them thousands of alternatives or hundreds, probably thousands a lot. Uh, I also do a little shout out for Benton and Sergey and Kika. That's that's <laughs> fast right there. Did you guys see that rumble? Yeah. Uh, layer traversal. So I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but. Um, you don't need the layer list. I have it hidden here. I'm going to bring it back a little later for some examples, but I'm not showing it here right now for a reason. And then limiting choices. That's ultimately what's fast. So you're probably wondering, like, okay, well, wh when do I start? Um, right, right now. So if you want to open Figma, you can sort of follow along with me. I'm going to give away this presentation afterwards, but um, I'm going to go over some examples of, of do's and don'ts with Figma. So first of all, how? How, how, like, how do you, how do you get fast? Right. Everybody says like, do these things or do this and that. And sort of the internet seems to pull you all these different ways. Right. They're like, read this article. Here's nine tips on moving really fast. It's like, well, okay, that's fine, but you're not really going to digest that. It's all about doing it in steps, sort of like onboarding into an app. So here's how, first of all, shortcuts, more shortcuts and type scales. And actually, shortcuts, the third one should be something else, but I forgot. Who cares? <laughs> I did this in 24 hours. So we're going to be learning shortcuts just a little bit. And if you're wondering, like, why should I learn shortcuts, you know, besides maybe the basics of, you know, drawing a shape or something, you're going to save time. And I'm going to break that down for you. You're going to save money because you're saving time. And I mean a lot of money. And you're going to be saving your wrists because if you're like me and you're using a trackpad, your wrists are most likely kind of messed up. And even if you're using a mouse, they still might be a little messed up unless you have one of those like, you know, goofy ergonomic side masks. No hate. I do like those. So let's do some math. Okay. So here's a really simple example of um, an absolutely basic interface. I think that this is something you could find in an iOS app, in an Android app, on a website. And this is something that you will do often. I use this as an example because it's everywhere on the internet, right? A really simple list made up of uh, rows and each row has a little header and a subheader. And I timed myself multiple times making this with hotkeys and then clicking each option rather than using what I had available to me. And I wasn't trying to be biased and, you know, like really take my time on the click thing and really take my time on the hotkeys. I went as fast as I possibly could. And so going from making this thing, so this means drawing the circle, getting the text on there, duplicating it, getting it auto layout to this, which is basically applying all of this together, duplicating it, creating an auto layout. And then finally, just changing some things, font weights, font styles, maybe a little bit of font size and compared the two. So hotkeys took me a minute and 17 seconds to build this, whereas clicking took me two minutes and 19 seconds, right? And if we break that down, <clears throat> here's a, sort of a, a, a breakdown of how I did the math. So I, I took the hotkeys over a lifetime, what well, it should be more like over a year versus clicked over a year. And let's say that you work four quality hours per day. There's no way you're working eight quality hours that if you are, you're, you're heathen. Um, and you're working 260, these are like sort of American working days, right? Not including weekends, not including holidays. If you did hotkeys, you would be able to make 48,623 lists, right? And obviously lists aren't something you're going to be making over and over again, but it's just a really good example of a, a very typical type um, of action you're going to be performing over and over again. So this is like, oof, that's so many. Wow. You're going to, if you're going to click them, you get a trash 26,935. So just a quick recap, 48,623 trash 26,935 on a clicked amount. You're just garbage. It's garbage. Don't do that. Save yourself time and money. So just get done really simply. You're saving an average of one minute per task by by using hotkeys or by not clicking or two hours per day. That's a lot of money and a lot of time spent. If you imagine this over the lifetime of working on something, 
you're losing a lot of money by clicking around and not learning hotkeys intentionally, no matter how frustrating they might be. So how do I how do I learn, right? How, how do you actually like get down to use the hotkeys? Like, sure, you could uh, you could look them up. Uh, you could learn a couple and just get by fine, and there's no problem with that. But let's talk about how to actually sort of get that done. So first of all, um, stop clicking. I mean, it's like it's really obvious. Just don't do it. Um, and I think more specifically, what I want you to do is every time that you want to click something, don't do it. And instead, check out the shortcut behind that. So hover on that tool. Or if you want, you can also hit, I believe it's command slash, which you can see on my screen, and it opens this command menu. And let's say we want to tidy something, right? You can actually see that the tidy up here shows the hotkey there. So you're able to just quickly do it. So just one shortcut at a time. So if you're like, oh, I'm going to learn all the tools at the same time, it's a bad idea. You're not going to remember them. Instead, next time you go and do something, don't click it. Figure out what the shortcut for it is and use that over and over again. Treat yourself to like one per day or two per day. And third, go full screen. This one's actually a, a way better challenge at learning what the different shortcuts are. Because when you go full screen, it makes you have to you know, deliberately think about what you want to do. So if I want to you know, to click this and I want to go in one more layer, I could hit command period and I could jump out, check what the shortcut is, command period, jump back in. And so it sort of forces you to learn those shortcuts as you go rather than, um, rather than staying outside of full screen the whole time. I'm not saying I design in full screen every time, but it is very helpful for learning quickly. Uh, I think thirdly, if you really want to know how, how to find every shortcut, this is a really great tool, um, not in full screen. If you click on the question mark down here, and then you go to keyboard shortcuts, there's even a keyboard shortcut to get to the keyboard shortcuts. I've never used it because it seems a little silly. But if you go into there, it has this really cool system that shows you exactly how to do each thing and whether or not you've used that particular hotkey. So it's really powerful for learning all those things. It's sort of a gamified way. But again, it stays in your way the whole time. Great for reference, no problem. Use it if you want. The second thing I want to talk about is traversal. So I think that this is probably one of the most important parts of uh, moving fast in Figma. But I wanted to, uh, if, if anybody has any questions first, I'm happy to take those. I'm going to take a sip of my uh, iced oat mocha. So I think traversal is one of the most important parts of Figma. And it's a bit like going through Webflow, where if you have to keep clicking every single layer, it's going to take a really long time to get through it. So you want to use those up and down arrow keys. And just like Figma, or just like Webflow, Figma has the same thing. But I would say uh, it's maybe even a little better. Because not only can you <clears throat> go up and down a layer or go um, you know, select another layer throughout the thing, you can ungroup and regroup and go through um, go through frames or auto layouts. So this is kind of one of the first things I do actually when I get into Figma. I hide my layer panel because I want the most room possible. There's only so much shortcutting you can do on the design panel. So if you hit Command Shift backslash it's in the upper right of your keyboard, I don't know what the Windows people are. I'm really sorry. I could add that afterwards, but this is for Mac people. Sorry, Diego. I like to hide the right panel, and that just makes it a lot easier to, to sort of see what's going on. You get a little more extra screen real estate. And then, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to give this as a presentation, but uh, or I'm going to give this out as a Figma file. But one of the things that I wanted to give away was sort of a, a little miniature tutorial for getting around, right? And I see this a lot where some, there will be this list. This is the same list that we saw earlier. And this is nested a few times. There's an auto layout frame with padding and then the, the separate list items, and then within that, the text items, and then the individual text. So I, I see this a lot where somebody wants to select thing, and they'll click for they'll double click, and they'll double click again, and then they'll double click again. And that's really going to waste a lot of your time. Just command click. Command click dives in the furthest possible layer that you can click on something. So if I click on this description text, it clicks. If I click on the container for the whole thing, it selects the whole thing. 
So that's something that I really want people to start using. And if you're not, you, that's like, that's not even a shortcut. Just use it. Like it, It's wasting your time if you don't. So I, what I want people to do, though, on this particular little exercise is to select the description text only, right? Just one of them. Doesn't really matter. And then in the next slide, um, we're going to go up a layer. So I want you to be able to go, like, basically traverse the layers upwards. And I'm going to unhide... Um, I'm going to unhide my layer list. And we're going to go up and we're going to select the where the fill is actually green. So if I hit shift enter enough times, I'll eventually go up to that green. And so this is going to save you a lot of time when you're trying to select things individually or even uh, as a whole. And if you imagine shift as sort of uh, the reverse key of whatever you're pressing, it makes it a lot easier to understand. So if I hit enter, it'll go deeper, right? And this is a really good method for like, let's say you select the description text and you go up and you have this individual item selected, but you wanna change or select you know, multiple things and you go up to the top layer and you hit enter a couple of times and you could end up selecting just the, the items within each auto layout cell. So it makes it a lot easier to sort of change your selection colors here, for example. The next thing is, um, I think that's a duplicate, my bad, uh, color picking. So I'm just going to go back to this layer and cheat a little bit. But I think the other thing is uh, a lot of people color pick very slowly. Um, it's really helpful to have, you know, inspiration and mood boards within your actual file. But going up, you know, selecting this and then going up a layer to, to, to the green and then quickly color picking with Control C. Again, I don't know what it is for, for Windows. I'm sorry. Being able to just quickly color pick any of these is extremely powerful, right? You can even do it um, on one of these pieces of text. And then the beauty of that is that once you do that, your selection colors here are unified. So if I select everything here, I can change it red. That's just going to save you a lot of time when it comes to actually um, swapping out colors. And I want to get to that sort of at the end, a little, a little trick that I use. Oh, Devin, just like a quick... Quick information because I'm testing yeah. the shortcuts here on Windows, and I can say that all shortcuts are completely different from Windows, like like completely <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll add the Windows shortcuts uh to this file afterwards. Nice. So I'm yeah. Thanks. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, I'm just gonna skip through these, but basically, um, when you go through these, I, I want you to kind of try doing these yourself. You know, going back into the list. Um, selecting the third item with tab, right? Tab is just like you would find on the web. You can you can select those, and you can even reorder the layers if you want. Now, reordering the layers is a little unique with auto layout, and I'm going to get into that um, a little bit later. But some examples of changing your text alignment, changing it to middle, changing it to right, and in my example, I say I want you to basically ch take each item and I want you to to you know decide what alignment for text you want to have. But the beauty of selecting the whole thing is that you can actually change the text alignment for the entire container unit. You can change everything all at the same time. Again, don't waste your time clicking things. Just apply it to the parent. It's a lot like Webflow, where you can just kind of apply it as as a whole rather than as a specific class. You can also change font sizes. So if I select this and I hold Command Shift and I do a right right caret, it's hard to see my keyboard with my microphone here. You can change the text sizes of all of them. And so this is really useful for like just quickly bumping up the size of the entire thing, or even more specifically selecting the black text and then changing that. Same thing with the title weight of each card. So if I'm selecting this. I can select just the just the title layers with the selection colors on the right. And you'll notice that there's a red color here. I'm going to explain that one in a second, despite not, not having a red color here. But again, if you hold Command Option and you do right, right arrow key, you can quickly jump up in weights. And this is really useful for when you're working on headings, because you can very quickly jump up a layer, select everything, and bump everything up and, and, and wait. So if you have, for example, this first item is a bold, and the second item is uh, extra light, which is awful. I would never do that. And you go and you bump it up. It won't bump it up to the to the two closest. 
it'll just bump it up to the next one in line. So it went from extra light to light, and this one went from uh, bold to extra bold. So it's really useful for kind of testing those things out. I'm going to skip this one, but this is just sort of moving the title around, repositioning things. And then at the final, I want you to undo it all. So everything that we did in the in the the last example, I want you to use only shortcuts to undo those things without Command Z. One of the things that I want to talk about is why I have this red color here. And this is a trick that I use in every single file. And you're, you're not seeing any red. If I zoom in here, there's no red to be seen. But the thing is, each image here is a fill, and there's a red layer behind it that you can't see. And the reason that I do that is so that I can select, let's say I want to select the first and last, right? I can do a color selection like that, no problem. Or if I have the subheader set to 54% black, I can select those. But with image fills, you can't select those because the image is a unique fill. So if I add some sort of random color behind it, the brighter, the better, because it's easy to stand out. And I select that, then we can automatically select each image with a fill or each fill with an image rather than having to select each one or tabbing over to it. And this also applies to something where um, let's say I have these three items here and I set them to like a bright green or something, right? I use this trick a lot where I'll create a, a shared color. And then what I'll do is apply the shared color here. Just make this green. That way, when I go to swap colors here, I can swap to a color that I really don't care about before swapping back to black. So it's a little complicated to understand. Um, if somebody wants me to explain it better, I'm, I'm happy to. What I mean is like, um, if you have to, if you, if you basically want to take an item that is uh, red and an item that is blue, and you want to swap those colors, I'll just show that really quick. Make this nice little red color, make this nice little blue color, and then I'll do like a third green color, right? So we'll just imagine that the green color is our sort of shared color. The problem with, with this um, is that if you have both of these selected and you want to change this, this red to this blue, right? Then the problem becomes the selection color is now unified rather than being completely separate. And obviously this is just two squares, so it'd be really easy to swap. So instead I have a third color, a shared color, so that I can quickly just change one and then change the other. Does that make sense? I can't see you guys, so I, you gotta say something. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. So again, <laughs> creating like some sort of throwaway shared color so that you can just swap to that, something bright and powerful that you'll never use in that particular design, and then changing your colors to be able to swap those. So um, I also wanna talk about auto layout. So we did shortcuts a little bit, use shortcuts, they're great. I think that auto layout is really great and I think a lot of people have become really intimidated by it. So I actually pulled an example of um, the Rayloom Rumble using this and I wanna show a couple of reasons why I, I really like to use auto layout in my designs. First of all, um, this is just a really small example of you know the nav, the hero, and then this like banner and product section. But when I'm working on a design and I have these sections, which is usually how I work, I'll create like a section for something, and I want to reorder them. Having auto layout means that all I have to do is tap the up arrow in order to swap the position of those things. Obviously, we're not gonna swap the position of the hero, but this is gonna save us a lot of time in terms of um, reorganization without having to, to resize the frame or whatever. And the entire thing has auto layout on it. So naturally, if this was just one line, the entire thing would be rearranged. And I did this on a, on a client that I've wrapped up about last week where every single frame at the end uh, had auto layout applied to the entire unit all the way down so that the copywriter and the designer could swap assets without things shifting around. And then I want to show off auto layout a little bit, if that's cool. I, I think that people get really confused by it, but some, uh, some really simple grouping here. So um, let's say that you made this little design, you did your type and you did your shapes or whatever, and, and you want to start organizing them. Um, before you even get into components, because those can get really troublesome, and I'm not going to get into that in this particular topic, um, I'm actually going to delete these last four 
because if they're all duplicates, I just want to style this one and I want to style these as well. So let's say I want, I want this maybe over here and I like this eyebrow here and then I, I'm going to get rid of that just for, just for ease of use, right? You have to think about it like Webflow where you want to group like things or divs that you would find, right? So I'm going to take these two and I'm going to hit shift A to auto layout them. And auto layout loves to do something where as soon as you group those things, uh, it removes your your sort of, uh, I actually don't know what to call these, your constraints, horizontal resizing and vertical resizing, okay? It loves to reset those things. So every time after I do an auto layout, I hit enter to go one layer deep, like we talked about earlier, and I swap these. So in this case, I'm gonna go with fill container because I want this to be able to flex as I, as I scroll this or resize this. And I also really like fill container even for like units as small as this, because then what it means is I can resize this and I can decide whether I want it right aligned, left aligned, or center aligned without having to worry about the individual sizes or having to deal with this little auto layout box. So it's just like a little trick. So I have these two, I have these two little pieces here. These are like items. And then I want to add this one as well. And I want to check the sizing here. So I've got 28. I'm going to maybe do 24. I'm going to go one layer deep and I hit tab. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to go one more time. So I have the entire auto layout unit selected. I hit enter. Now it has both items selected, but if I hit tab, it automatically selects the next item, which in this case is the only other item. So I don't even have to select one in particular. This is something that I use really often, just hitting enter and hitting tab to select that first item. Again, like I said, like I said, if you auto layout something, auto layout loves to make the child fixed instead of hug or fill container. So I want it to be fill container and it loves to break. Just fix that there. And this might seem really slow at first, but I promise uh, as you get faster and faster at it, you're just going to save a ton of time. And so with that little trick, I can, I can hit enter and I can jump back to this and check the measurements, check where it's aligned, whatever, and then do this little thing. So I'm just going to knock this out really quick. Hit enter to select both items, fill container, both of these. I'm just going to change some of the measurements here. And then if I duplicate this, and I just, whoops, and I add auto layout, even though the measurement's not right, it doesn't matter because I can select the next item and just keep duplicating it, jump up a layer, change the measurements, change every single unit to fill multiple times, just keep hitting enter. And so now when we resize it, it will automatically scale. So we don't have to worry about that because this is exactly how the web works anyways. We already have our measurements here. We can increase those if we want because each of them is fill it's automatically flex themselves within that container unit. And all we have to do is take these things and sort of start putting them together and boom, I align these, take these, make them 48, add some padding, add a little bit of that, a little bit of that, some white, boom, there you go. That's pretty much it. That's all you have to do. So auto layout is really powerful. I think a lot of people um, discount it for being difficult, but really it's just about those things sort of resetting and being able to change those things um, quickly within within constraints because that's just how the web works, right? It's not a free floating little, little toy. But if you did want to do free floating, um, I'm just going to get a little shape up here. Brandon from... Uh, Bones Co. introduced me to Shaper, which I really like. I'm going to do a little heart here, right? One thing that Auto Layout recently introduced, if I take that out and I try to put it in here, it's going to reflow the entire thing. But it's a bit like position absolute, where it's, it's even called absolute position in it. And so then I can automatically arrange this wherever I want within this and even adjust what it's behind or what it's in front of without having to do anything. By the way, if anybody's asking anything in chat, I seriously cannot read it. So like, please call those out to me. I have no idea. Yeah. Michael has a question. When you all, when you all are designing for web in Figma, 
Do you apply all of this responsive auto layout techniques for the developer, or do you have to make a static design at a couple different breakpoints like desktop and mobile? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it really, it really depends how good your developer is. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm used to getting the web design, uh, Figma back from the Unful web designers and they just make static designs at desktop and and mobile and a lot of times i'll yeah. come back and ask questions you know how do you how small do you want this for example the design you're doing right right here like when do you want this to go down to two lines or you know things like that yeah yeah and that's something that's that's just something where you have to have a relationship with your developer where you're you're bringing them in early and you're showing them often sort of what's going on and how those things function so if it's something that doesn't become automatically clear then you need to either make that clear with a um, some sort of small static mock-up rather than doing a really complex prototype or just talk it out, like just explain to them what you want to happen. Um, but I usually, I, I really like to build um, with auto layout because then it allows me to sort of tell the, tell the developer like, okay, here, you know, here's what I want to happen. I want, when I flex this, like I want these things to sort of, um, I want these things to like float, right? I want them to, these two to be stretched as far as part. I want these to, be able to flex and change their width or whatever. So I think it's great for that. I do it for mobile. I do it for desktop. Um, but I think if your question is um, how, like, when do I do it? I do it all the time. And I create usually two to three breakpoints, desktop and mobiles, and then uh, like a tablet, if that answers your question. And I think that the beauty of, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, no, I, I think that like if um, if you start like this on desktop, it actually just makes creating mobile that much quicker. Um, it it does. You... Yeah, I was going to show that. Um, so like if I just take this, for example, and we're like, OK, we're going to make this mobile. Right. I'm just going to say this is 390. Right. And, and obviously this looks really broken. If I just change the the width here to 16, I'm going to do 16 on the top. I, I don't know. I'm going to change, I'm just going to make up a size for this, but we're going to do like 32 for the H1. And then rather than do these side by side, I'm just going to click mm -hmm. down. We're done. Like that's it. Yeah. Obviously it's not perfect, but being able to do the individual pieces is going to save you a hell of a lot of time, you know, versus dragging frames and, and repositioning those. Let Figma do the work for you. You don't want to have to take this, you know, this whole thing and, and do what I used to do where I'd, I go, okay, um, well, it's uh, 1307 pixels. And then I'll do, I'll, you know, I'll do divide by, um, I, I'll do, I'll subtract 16 times three because that's for the gap. And then I'll divide by four. Just let yeah. Figma do the work <laughs> for you. And it, it also, I think, um, it helps the designers be more consistent too. Like, so when they're, you know, for example, let's say you have a, a, on desktop, you have 80 pixels between sections or something, and that's the use on all their sections. And they go down to mobile when they're changing that. It's going to change kind of appropriately. Like if you're doing it for one section, it'll do it for yeah uh, potentially all the sections depending on how you have yeah. set up. But. I don't I don't um, have it open right now the the Rumble, and I can't click home because then you'd see all my files. But um, <laughs> a really good example of this. So I'm just going to duplicate this a couple of times. Obviously, see this the same thing over and over again. Maybe I'll just change the color to like quickly get what I'm talking about. But um, what Michael's talking about, though, is like, if you just have, let's say that all of the sections share extremely similar um, padding, right? Which is something that I do. A lot of designers and developers do this, but they all share the same padding and you have selected all of them. Changing the padding for those is not a problem. You can quickly test out how big or how small you want this to be doing any extra work and i think that's like the beauty of auto layout that people are discounting is that i can move faster than you because my stuff goes automatically and you have to do it manually right i'm not dealing in pixels like tiny little pixels i'm just going okay i want four items and i want them to fit yeah i love it i also think it helps the designers like um understand webflow or how we're developing a little bit better yeah. too yeah exactly um, yeah, so that's that's awesome. I'm take, I'm pulling this part out specifically. I'm gonna send it to Ben and Alex at Uncle. <laughs> They're gonna hate me. <laughs> um, I also want to talk about type scales. I think that you should use them. Um, 
And I, and I just want to read it real, real quick. We've done hotkeys. You should use those. Auto layout. Use those. Don't be afraid of them. Learn them. I'm happy to walk people through them. If you DM me, I will explain to you why or why not your thing isn't working. And then type scales. These are things that you have to use. Right? So I think that one one thing about type skills that can be really daunting is someone saying like, "Oh, I don't I don't know what size they should be. I don't I don't know what typeface I should use. I don't even know sort of what weight." People get really tripped up in choosing a typeface. So I, I want to talk about like how you can make something really simply sort of look good without any work. So first of all, excuse me. I want you to start with just one typeface, right? A lot of people pick three or four and I'm like, dude, chill. You haven't even picked one good one yet. So I'm going to go with, uh, this is obviously enter. I'm going to swap for something else, but, um, actually no, I'm gonna stick with enter just for this, just for this example, but I've got some text here. This is actually from one of the agency sites that I worked on, but if we start pulling these out, we're like, okay, this is, uh, this is our, this is our H2. And then these are our individual H3s. Um, and then we've got like a, a little button here. I'm just going to slap a little auto layout on there. And we're like, okay, cool. Let's, let's start to organize these maybe in like a really basic way. Like you'd find on a, a website. Let's just start literally just start with this. Like, don't do weights, don't do sizes yet. Just start with this and have an idea for how things should be positioned, how you think the organization should be, and then move on from there. So I'm just gonna copy paste that. We're gonna move over to this different section. So we're gonna take that one single font that we chose and instead we're gonna start choosing sizes, still keeping the same weight, right? We can worry about the weight later. And I put a little, uh, little font size shortcut hotkey there. So you can use that when you work on it. I'm going to use the built-in uh, Figma font sizes just for demonstration purposes. But obviously we have our H1 here. I'm going to make that nice and large, right? I'm going to center that. We have our little uh, little subheader. I like I like 16. I also think 18 is really great. And then our, our little H2 here. I'm going to go with, uh, what, what did I say this one was? 64. I'm going to do maybe 36 for the H2 and then our little, our tiny little H3s, right? I'm going to say that each of these is, I don't know, 20, whatever. And I'm going to just quickly generate some, uh, some lorem ipsum for, for each of these items. That's like the shortest lorem ipsum. What is this doing? That's like, really, that's too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using That's a awesome. I'm using a, a raycast uh, generator for this. Um, it's in the very last in the very last uh, thing. Whatever. This is this is just stupid. I'm just going to delete some of this. It's annoying. I'm going to say this is 200. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'm going to copy paste this. So uh, I'm just going to bump up our, my H3s a little bit, but this gives you a really good idea of like how to sort of start working on those, those individual pieces, like how, how you feel about the size of the elements rather than the weight of the elements. Like, does this feel good as a single weight? It's sort of like building out a wireframe where everything is in black and white. It lets you focus on the things that are, that are most important rather than, you know, the, the tiny little details that you care about later. Like, does that feel good to you guys? I'm serious. I'm asking a question. Does that feel good to you? No. What would you do? No. You can't change the weight. What would you change for the font sizes? The line spacing? The line spacing? Well, we'll do that later. But oh, okay. Yeah. But like more specifically. Anything? Uh, opacity. Opacity? Sure. We can we can talk about opacity a little bit. Opacity is a good way to like, you know, change hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy. So this looks as it can get for many sizes. We're not going to really focus too much on this. We're going to take this over to the next part. The next thing, <laughs> the next thing you're going to want to do is like the line height stuff. So I think with the line height stuff, um, it's really important. I really like anywhere from 130 percent to 150 percent for 
like paragraphs. I think that for inter in particular, that looks a little wide. I'd maybe even do 120%. And then for things like the headings, I, I like to keep those as tight as possible so that if they wrap, you don't get tons of space here. Like if, here's what this looks like at 120%. I like a tighter spacing. That's just a personal preference thing. Start to adjust that. We look even better. I'm not, I'm not gonna mess around with that even more. And then we can start messing with weight. So if I apply, let's say this one's bold and the, whatever, this one's also bold and these are bold too. <laughs> we'll do medium like that. That alone really starts to, to make this look good. And, and we haven't even like done color yet. We haven't even done any of the, um, any of the, the, the true like tight details, you know, and it, it looks great. Like as is like a, in, a, in a really basic format, if you were to show this to a client, you'd be like, yeah, that's, that's a wireframe. Great. So again, I just want to, I just want to reiterate, start with one typeface first before you decide that you need another one. And if you're going to choose another one, try choosing completely different typefaces, uh, sort of opposing typefaces, a serif and a sans serif or a, um, you know, a serif and then a, a display font or sans serif and a display font, something just wild and out there. And only use that a couple of times. Use it sparingly. Uh, choose different sizes, but stick to one weight. And then after that, you know, sort of adjust your line height or you can also do your weight at the same time. So if you go in that order, I think you'll find things are a lot easier to sort of work through, right? Creating these like constraints for yourself, not just constraints for um, what you can choose, like the, the, the font size and stuff, but more specifically constraining yourself each step of the way. And then lastly, for the type stuff, um, use someone's scale. Like you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not a unique person. Um, you're not the best designer in the world. Everybody has done a type scale. Here's one from material design on the left. Uh, there's one from F and suite. If you just do like you know, duplicate the client first system. It's built into there. You can just go to their website if you want and inspect those. Even the book Refactoring UI has a nice little type scale. I personally like to work in increments of eight. That being said, I, I do break that sometimes, but I think you should know the rule before you break it. Um, but don't, you know, don't make your own type scale unless you, you know, you're really passionate about it and you really want to. But for now, stick to somebody else's. They know what line height works for that font that they chose. They know what size works for H1s and things like that. Um, or use uh, Figma scale. Figma scale is great. Like if you click on uh, any of this text here, you can see that there's these preset numbers here, right? These are great. They're like mostly in increments of eight till they get down to, you know, 15, which is a weird one or 13. Don't use those unless you're like on iOS or something. But this one's automatic. You don't have to do any work. Just use those. That's you. You're a baby. You don't know how to use anything. Um, Devin, one second. Uh, yeah. Ivan has a comment. Yeah. And then we also have two more questions. Okay. Oh, no, I, I wanted to mention that earlier when uh, Michael was asking about creating the different screen sizes, I like to use a plugin of breakpoints. Yeah. Where actually, and I had that worked well where I worked with developers and they were like, well, I want to see how this breaks in Figma. Show me, create a prototype. I was like, I'll, I'll do better. I create you a I use the breakpoints plugin and right on the artboard I create the um the different breaks and you said the different notes whether it be tablet mobile yeah uh the like two extra desktop and it works really really well I I haven't I haven't heard or actually I think I saw that one on Twitter and um I tend to stay away from plugins that maybe require other people have them or know how to use them um, just in case I, I haven't really seen that one a whole lot, but if it creates static, uh, breakpoints rather than forcing the developer to like click through, then that's great. No, actually it's not a, uh, it's not static. It's actually dynamic. Yeah. You, you, you can actually, uh, scroll, you get a bar with all the sizes and you scroll through every breakpoint, whether it be 320, 768 yeah. and so forth. And you could see if you're using auto layout, kind of like you were showing earlier, you will see how it, it, it will change and it will reflow the, the design based on that screen size. That's cool. It works, yeah. It works really, really well. I, I have always recommended that. 
I think um, so. It was like I was saying. I tend to avoid plugins where the the developer might not know where to find it or how to activate it in favor right. of something where they could just look at it and sort of click around and inspect because they they have a lot of work to do too and they don't want to be fiddling with um, you know tiny tiny little plugins. But it sounds cool. I want to check it out. Yeah, definitely. I have to ask you something, Devin. Do you want? Yeah. I, this is probably just me. It's part of my OCD kicking in. But do you uh, do you always keep all your layers open like that? Because I, I I love collapsing it using the hotkey from Figma. The option. Oh, now. Uh, I I actually I usually I usually work like this. Just no. Gotcha. No layer panel yeah. at all. Um, I think the layer panel really only comes in handy when like. I'm working with more complex shapes and right. dealing with like subtract union, things like that, where I might want to select something that is more difficult to find. But for the most part, even with those, I just tab through each object. I just yeah. really like to have this extra free space available. Right. All right. Thanks. M okay, Melissa, you have... said, yeah. Yeah. We have another question from Michael. Do you have a final Figma file completely ready for Dev that you'd be willing to share that we could reference? And then <laughs> there's a thing. Michael, ask me yourself, coward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, did. I don't know how else to ask. Uh, yeah, dude, I, I, I'll share. I'll share something with you. Uh, like something like complicated or something simple. Like, what are you looking for? Uh, I, I think that's really up to you. It's more like what you're willing to share. I think I'm just looking for uh, a Figma file that is completely like primmed and ready for dev that's using auto layout and like a style guide yeah. and something that I can share with our web designers. And, you know, I like them to go off and be crazy and stuff and be fast. But yeah. at the same time, yeah. like I need that organization at the end to go build it in Webflow. And it'd be really nice if instead of like, just trying to like give tips or make a checklist at the end that, um, you know, I can give them a visual of what we're trying to, trying to get to. Like, we're just trying to be like you, Devin. Yeah. Yeah. Afterwards, um, shoot me a DM and I will send okay. you a very NDA heavy file just as long as. Uh, yeah. I won't, I won't, I won't. No, no, we all need it. I have it too? Everyone, yeah. everyone wants it. I want it. <laughs> I want to move some words in the and stuff. Yeah, it's, the, it's the, uh, from my most recent client uh, that I that oh, I wrote yeah, last I know. week. Yeah, I yeah know. you know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you never Don't say, say it. It. this this juicy file. It, my uh, my other follow up question to that was um, like right now I'm putting together like uh, for our web designers like a, a handoff checklist like just to make sure like um just different things that i want to make sure that as they're moving fast that when they hand off that final file everything's kind of checked off i'm just curious if anybody's come yeah. across like a really good figma dev handoff checklist or if there's something mm. that you use and if anybody has something to share or something they found that you can purchase yeah uh i started working on one for myself um i'm using a combination of things from webflows checklist uh from A11Y's accessibility checklist, and then from uh, shift, uh, Matt Matt Smith um, from MDS. He has a great one too. Uh, I think Shift Nudge gave one away for free. It's really great. Oh man! Well, if you can share those things too, whatever we yeah. whatever we can get from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll put together a, a file for you guys. I can't promise awesome. today, but I'll, I'll put one together. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is that the okay, last? Okay. The next question yeah. is from Zach. He says, when it comes to fonts, so going back to this, okay. how are font sizes calculated? I've seen some people go off like an 8 pixel scale or REM scale or 4.143 scale, et cetera. Yeah. Are you designing on sizes uh, or deciding on sizes that, oh, damn, wait, that will be going to development? Yeah, uh, that's that's a good question. So... I touch on I touch on the eight pixel grid a little bit later in this, just like just very briefly. But I'm gonna be real; I ran out of time. Uh, but I, so I'll answer this question. Um, when it comes to type scale, I still like I've been doing this for 
a decade now and I still use other people's type scales because I think that they're really good. And I, I especially really like to go to like, uh, um, the type foundries website. Like if there's a typeface that I'm using, I go to the type foundries website and I find their specimen book online or even just like the webpage itself. And I like to see what they set for their type. So not just the, the size of the fonts, but also what like the line height is or what the tracking is um, of the individual text because they're the ones that made the font they know best. That being said, I do take some, some small, you know, changes into account if I want it to be tighter or bigger or whatever, but to answer your eight pixel question, um, I do, I do try to stick to somewhat of an eight pixel grid for vertical rhythm's sake. Um, I think that there's only so much you can really do like all these numbers are divisible by eight. I think that one rule that I break though, is that once I get, once I get closer to eight, you obviously lose the amount of divisibility. So you go from like 16 to eight to then zero and zero is not a font size. So I'll do like eight, I'll do 12 and I'll do four. Cause I sort of want to be able to, to jump into smaller sizes. And even with a line height, I do try to stick to eight as close as possible. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Anything else, Melissa? Nope, we're good to go. Cool. Uh, iconography, this one's really simple. Like if you want to do your own icons, you can use somebody else's if you want, but I'm, I'm gonna make it really, really simple for you. So here's just like a set of icons that I did actually for Jumbo Privacy. These are, um, these are in the product now. I think there's about 128 or so icons. I also did the icons for my little Webflow UI project and the entire icon system for uh, Zeusk.com, the dating app. And I want to explain just really simply how to make these. So this is just like a little breakdown of like the sort of shared attributes. So that's another thing, limiting your attributes. If you're going to, if you're going to make icons, try to stick to a stroke or a fill, uh, try to stick to a single border radius. And then I only do one size ever and, and decide what kind of caps you want. And so um, if we look at these, they're all 24 by 24 pixels. They're all two pixel stroke on each individual line. And then I even sometimes create rules for like what I want the spacing to be between lines. What's my limit? What's my maximum? Again, putting these rules on yourself over and over at every step of the way is only going to lead to a better product. And you can kind of see here that I even do like a little bit of um, rounded caps on the outside too. And you're like, oh, well, you know, what size should I make them? How, like, how should I draw them? <laughs> well, that that's a cheat code in itself. We're just going to jump right to that. So you see these, they're all 24 pixels. It's a really small image. So I'm going to blow them up for you. And I'm going to show a couple of icons that I made within those boundaries. So these are Google's icon boundaries and Google's genius for this. Um, each of these is 24 pixels. All of them have two pixels spacing on the side. So like on the edge, they're all spaced two pixels out. And Google basically says, okay, if it's a square, it looks like this, if the circle looks like this. And if it's a taller icon, it's, it's basically the, the same as the, the other rectangle, but turned sideways. And so this will allow you to sort of find that balance as you're making icons and not have to worry about like the tiny intricate details. You can just sort of work, right? When you add constraints to making anything, it means you get to think more about the important things and less about the tiny details. So here's an example of like a square icon. If I click into this, this is 20 by 20, right? Just 24 pixels minus two minus two. Technically a square icon because it's within those constraints. This is like a toggle icon. Example of a, a circle one, a tall rectangle. And this works because again, it's still in this constraint and I'm balancing a heavier object versus a lighter object. So that's a bit of like graphic design, like balancing stuff, whatever. And then a credit card. So it's just like a really easy way to make icons without having to think about anything, right? Just 24 pixels, set up your little shape grid. You can even overlay them if you want, something that I do sometimes. And then just start drawing. One really easy way to create an icon system that you feel matches the brand is to take the logo 
or the typeface that you're using for that particular brand and start finding identifying factors about it. What's the thickness of the typeface you're using? Is it edgy? Is it rounded? Is it fun? Is there spacing between something? Like how are these things gapped? And then start applying that to your actual icons. Any questions, Melissa? No, sir. Cool, cool. Um, and then I think this might be the last one, colors. This one's gonna be really quick. Uh, this is a rule that I learned from Flux Academy that I still use over and over again. Uh, I took a couple websites from Godly or from uh, Landbook, um, and I use them in this example just to prove how simple this is to use. So if you're choosing colors for your website, obviously colors are really difficult. Um, uh, even though I've been doing this for a while, I still find it to be difficult. If you're good at colors, God bless you. Um, you deserve it. But I, li I like to use the 60-30-10 rule. So the way that this works is basically you say 60% of the color on the website, 30% of the color on the website, and then 10% of the color on the website. So this is Dan Mall's new website. It's really nice, by the way, danmall.com, great designer. Um, you can obviously see that 60% of the site is white. This photo doesn't count, right? If you go through the rest of the site, it's white. Black being the 30%. The screen doesn't count because this is just sort of our hero area. But if you go across the different parts of the website, the text is black or the buttons are black or green. And then 10% is green. So that's our color that really pops, right? And this is just like a really simple breakdown for making things look phenomenal without any work. Just choose two colors and then pick your bright CTA and then you're done. You don't have to do any work. Here's another example. This is actually uh, Diego's website. This one follows the same exact rules. I don't know if he's still here, but- Yeah, I am. <laughs> this one follows the same rules. So you're like, okay, well, this is, this is the easy one. It's obviously sort of a gray color with like a black as the 30%. And then the 10%, you don't see in the screenshot, but if you go down to the footer, there's like a block of a couple different colors. That's his 10%. It's not found anywhere else on the website except the footer. So it's allowed. That rule works and it makes it look really good for it. Thank you. I want to make a comment on that. Yeah. We actually spoke about that on the Slack channel, or I saw a comment from someone uh calling that out to diego saying like oh the footer has more oh colors. yeah it doesn't make that. sense remember so this yeah. is a great explanation to that yeah um <clears throat> it is that. and i was actually one of the people that commented on it um i said that <laughs> i said that i just didn't like some of the colors i didn't say that they were wrong in their use i just said that i didn't like some of the colors <laughs> so but he's doing everything right i mean that's the point that i'm trying to make and then lastly, um, I don't remember what this site is called. You've probably seen it. I went to a land book and I sorted by top websites of like this year. And this is a, just another great example of that in use. Our primary color is this black. We have got a little bit of white for the 30%. I wanted an example of a dark mode. And then rather than choose one color, they're doing more of a gradient thing, which is something that you can do too. So I put that here as like our little 10% color and they use that throughout the whole site. And so it just makes everything pop, right? So it separates the, the content that you need to read and the background from the things that the designer really wants you to look at. Okay, before we, we keep going on that, um, Michael has a question. Okay. So when I- Again, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we love questions, Michael. Okay. So he wants to know when icons are inside of a frame to keep oh. them all to the same size, there's actually padding on every side. Does it bother you that when everything is aligned to the left, then the icon is kind of off because it has padding around? Do you know what I mean? No, I, I, I'm not. And I'll show you why. Um, I used to I used to think a little <laughs> differently, too. So let's just I'm just going to add this here. I want to make this like 16 with 24. 24 line height, right? I'm gonna do 16 here. For some reason, Figma keeps auto uppercase my my stuff. I don't know why. But anyways, um, the reason that I do uh, the reason I do a space around it, and I, I don't just do it because Google's like do it. I do it because there's there's a spacing reason. So if I do, uh, I'll I'll do like profile here, whatever. 
and I'll swap this out here. Um, You're such a product designer. Like that's such a thing that like we would, we, we, that build websites would be like home about us and you're like home profile. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Uh, God damn. Uh, <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so I get what you're saying about like, if it's left aligned, right? Like if, if both of these are left aligned here and there's a bit of spacing here, one, one advantage to having that padding is that it, it unifies every single icon. And so if you have an icon where, um, for example, like, let's say that, um, let's say that this one has padding and then this one maybe doesn't like, it's a wider icon. I'll pull this one out too. Um, and this one is more like a taller icon. Mm -hmm. so, okay. If we, if we make the exact same example, I'm like clicking around instead of using hotkeys. I can't see my keyboard, guys. Give me a break. <laughs> um, Chill, man. What, Nobody's and, saying anything. <laughs> this is a good example, though, of why the padding works, right? This is our wide icon, this house, even though it's not. And this is our tall icon, which is a person. Suddenly you get this weird sort of like river, this like gap here. And it doesn't feel right. And you can't quite pick out why. It's because there's padding on the left and the right here, but there isn't on this one. But if you have padding everywhere, it always feels sort of unified. Yeah, um, no, I, to I totally agree with, and, with it. And I then sometimes like you can end up, if you have buttons that are like really close to one another, they can end up like butting up against each other and looking really weird. I, this example doesn't work for Inter because it's a great font, um, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, if you use that same example and you use more like, um, let's say you have an icon on top and below it, you have a paragraph. So it's maybe sure. like if you swap those and then you have a paragraph and everything's aligned left. Um, yeah. And if it was more of like a paragraph text where the that spacing before the H, for example, wouldn't be as pronounced. Um, like maybe it's 16 or 18 or something like that, whatever you... And everything okay. is aligned left. And then it's not the wide house. You still have the... You still yeah. have the, that's the beauty of being able to drag that icon in because <laughs> you have yeah. everything out of that. And well, so it's thing, not very pronounced in this one, but. Yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying with the like alignment here. And I think yeah. that that's the thing with text is that usually text doesn't like text isn't outlined. It doesn't like line up exactly, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's always going to have like a little bit of a gap. And I think when you're looking at it at a full size, no one's going to take a ruler and like, okay, let's make sure that this perfectly lines up. <laughs> I mean, really what's important here is having the icons be unified, right? To share the same design language and feel like they are equals rather than standing out. You don't want one icon to stand out among, an, amongst another one. And then I also think that, uh, you know, on the left and right aligned stuff, that's where it's like really extra important to have that padding so that those things don't look uneven. Totally. I, I just thought, I, I do it the same way that you're doing it with the padding. Yeah, so that's how it's yeah. designed for me. Um, and then when I put it on the web, I'm always like, who's judging me because that doesn't perfectly line up. <laughs> and then I see people in the chat and like Christine and Maria are like, I'll take a ruler. I would see it. And I'm like, oh, cool. And you're over here trying to reassure me. It's okay. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the yeah. problem with a ruler is that if you have it on auto layout, then you would have to make the icon absolute, right? Yeah. To be able to move it. So it kind of yeah. becomes a little annoying there. Yeah, so the, the padding really just takes, it's just like anything that I've demonstrated so far, it takes all the thinking out of it. Like, I, that's that's what I want you to take away from this, is like, it's not just, moving fit fast in Figma isn't just using the hotkeys. It's taking the thinking out, out of the stuff that you don't need to be thinking about and moving that headspace to something that you could be, you know, putting better time into, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really get to this, sorry. Uh, but I'll just say, use the eight pixel grid system, um, for consistency sake, right? It's really easy to do math like that. I even put easy to remember eight, 16, 24, 32, 40, 56. Like that stuff's really easy to remember. It also adds vertical rhythm to your page. So things end up looking nice. Even if you don't know why for users, this is a really comforting feeling. And then, uh, last but not least, you're not unique. Uh, 
I think I, I talked to Gabriel about this. I, he said like, why should I use the apixel grid system? I want it to be unique. Um, it's not about being unique. Uh, using an apixel grid system is, is not about like trying to, you know, take a shortcut or, you know, be easy. It, it's, it's about the consistency. It's about taking that thinking out of what spacing my thing should have between another item and putting it more into the UX. Does this thing feel right rather than does it look right? Yeah. So if you think that you're better than designers throughout time, you're, you're not. Oh yeah. For, <sighs> the slides undone, whatever. Anyways. Um, so we're, we're kind of at the end now uh and i have like a list of resources how how else can i learn more betterly um i have some book recommendations i think refactoring ui by adam wathan and steve shoger is awesome it's not about um ux it's strictly about ui i think i gave this book to brie and i think maria as well but i reference this book still years later i mean the examples that they have are a little old now but they're great don't make me think by Steve Krug. Love, love, love this book. I read it once a year. Um, it's just about making really easy design decisions that uh, probably people take for granted. If you want to do a step up, the laws of simplicity by John Beta are just about sort of minimalism and simplifying your designs. This one's great if you have too much stuff going on. And then uh, this is only tangentially related, but understanding comics by Scott McCloud is like one of my all time favorites. It's technically not even about design. It's literally about understanding and reading comic books. A lot of designers reference it. And I think if you read, if you read the book, you'll, you'll understand why as well. Um, I got some courses on here. I put Diego here. Um, he, he only deserves uh, a mention because I think his recent video was spot on in terms of what I was going to talk about. So if you get a chance, go and watch that. Um, He's Diego Live on Twitter. I don't know what his YouTube is. Maybe he'll shout it out here. Shift Nudge by Matt Smith. Flux Academy, Ron Segal and team. And then I like that guy, Arno Rose on YouTube. He's great. Um, I am a little sad I didn't put any um, women on here. I don't I don't really follow a whole lot of YouTubers generally. But like, if you have some, I would love to shout out some, some women on this list too. Um, I have a bunch of inspiration. I'm not going to go over these. But... They'll be in the slides and you can have them. Uh, and then some of the plugins that I really like to use. Uh, I like Shadow Kits. Uh, Shadow Kits great for just like making shadows. Um, Laura Mipsum is a great plugin. Uh, I personally used Raycast, which is a search bar replacement where I can quickly generate sentences and paragraphs. Um, Contrast. I have this as a Mac menu bar, but it's also a Figma plugin where you can quickly check ADA compliance for uh, color contrast of a button or text or whatever. Really like MacMaker. MacMaker just takes Google Maps and puts it in a shape. Um, Shaper, showed that one earlier. Thanks for that, Brandon. And then Unsplash, just just add some images. Just like quickly generate some images for your client. Like you don't have to have, you know, all the content ready. Just generate something for them. And some of the apps that I use, not a big deal. Uh, I just want to give a special shout out to Sim Daltonism. It's an app that probably most people haven't heard of, but um, you launch it and it opens a giant window that it basically overlays all of your other windows and you can simulate colorblindness with it. It's really awesome. And that's it. That's all I got. Wow. <laughs> I hope it wasn't I hope it wasn't overwhelming and, and that you learned something. Uh, you kidding? Of course we did. We loved it. I'm sure everybody here loved it. Thank you so much for doing this. This was all the effort. Just want to call out that he did this in two days. So respect to Devin. Yeah, you absolutely yeah. killed it. I told you you were going to kill it. Uh, yeah, I would love to take questions or comments or comments. Yeah. yeah. If, if yeah, guys, I'll mute yourself. Ask whatever. Like, I don't think there's such a thing as a dumb question unless you ask, yeah. like, is Sketch better than Figma, which, like, we're not talking about here. I mean, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know we have a difference in opinion. Uh, Devin, <laughs> I, I have a really important question. Yeah. If you don't mind. Oh, God. Can I, can I have your autograph? <laughs> are you going to, are you going to no code? No, I'm not. No. But I'll fly to New, but I'll fly to New York just to get it. As I come oh. back to Winnipeg. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Okay, sweet. <laughs> what else do we have? Relevant question. Are yeah. you going to the flag flags meetup? Uh, when or where is that? Ah, oh, Tuesday, in San Francisco. Oh, uh, with um. With Ron. Oh no, <laughs> I'm yeah. going to Rymar's though. Yeah, I'll go also there. I was like, I'm yeah. trying to find people that will go both. <laughs> yeah. Wait, which one's the other one? By Flux Academy for students. Uh, probably not. Oh, nice. Can I, yeah, I share my screen? Or... Yeah, of course. Okay. Go ahead. Let's stop Let's my stop. recording too. Devin, I want yeah. more. You were born to do this. <laughs> How to get okay, better? Okay, we have a question from Evan. That back to the subject. Sorry, I just wanted to keep it like in the topic so we don't get out of it before people ask questions. So, um, apologies if you already addressed this, but do you use auto layout when iterating, or when do you when do you implement auto layout? Um. Yeah. So. I think in the example, like as I was working through those, um, I was maybe a little slower at auto layout, but like I've gotten really fast at using it. So when I do iterate, um, I do really like to use auto layout simply because I can do it quickly and because um, it it really does perform just like you would find building something on a website. And so I understand that iterating and being creative is important, and I totally agree um but for me i yeah i use i use auto layout a lot a lot a lot even when i'm working on wireframes or production yeah because, i think go ahead oh, let me just yeah well, just one, one more thing on that um when i use auto layout on wireframes what that means for me is that or, or even what it means for the client is that as soon as they sign off on that file and they're like, I like this, you know, I want, you know, let's, let's move from that to hi-fi. That jump for me is nothing. Like I just drag and drop the wireframes over, change colors, tighten up the spacing and it's done. Like I don't have to do any more work on that stuff. I can, I can focus on the things that I really want to focus on. Yeah. What Christine said too, I use auto layout as soon as I see myself repeating co uh, components. Yeah, I think like, you know, auto layout is great, um, but there's just really like preference because you really, to to be fast, which is the main topic of this class, auto layout is great. But yeah, for other people, the design, for example, Gabriel, which makes sense that he asked that question to you, yeah. Kevin, like he creates websites that are just very, um, you know, sort of editorial style. So for him, it doesn't really make sense because maybe you only have one paragraph here to the bottom of the right and a big bold heading on the top uh, right. So maybe for yeah. him, it doesn't really make sense. But when you're designing a website for, let's say, a bigger client, a website that has, I don't know, 12 pages and there's components that are repetitive, auto layout is perfect because yeah. you have that repetitive um concept throughout the site and then it just gives you more organization also auto layout is great for buttons cards you know things that are smaller that you can um you don't really have to worry about padding and stuff like that auto layout yeah. just gives you everything there yeah I, I think i think that's probably like where i take a really hard stance is like if you're creating buttons and you're not using auto layout you're being foolish because there is literally no better way to create a button. It's it, the most accurate way to build one too. So just use it. For like e-commerce sites that you're designing that there's a lot of repetitive grids. Yeah. That's perfect. Like the one you did for the rumble. Yeah. I, I think Autoleo is really good for grids because, um, you know, it's like I said, you don't want to be doing that math. Like that's what we used to have to do in Photoshop and even in Sketch mm -hmm. for, for a bit was, you know, take the max width of the container, subtract the padding on, on, on each side or even the margins between each item and then divide that by the amount of items in the container. And then you'd have to do that for the height and the text as well and have to figure that out. So using <laughs> auto layout really just sort of 
helps with that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then Jazz asks, how do you get better at choosing typefaces? That's so a pleasure. <laughs> what do you mean? It's a I, I'm still like it, it's it's a pleasure, but it's also like really stressful. I think when I design things for myself, um, I don't have an answer for you. But when it comes to designing for clients, it's that I think that's that's easy, right? You you pick um you pick fonts where you feel like I mean, I wish I'd give you a better answer to this, but you feel like they match the personality, right? You also yeah. want to choose a typeface where if your client, for example, is uh, let's say a law, a law firm, right? Where they they use a lot of text in almost everything that they do and they want that branding to be carried over into their documents and your typeface doesn't support special characters, you're fucked. So like you want to choose things that are flexible, but you also want to choose things that, that feel like they match the client. I have a really great list of um, type foundries. If you want it, I'll put it in chat. Mm -hmm. uh and then you can sort of comb through there i think for the most part stay away from defont um i don't want to say stay away from google fonts but there are a lot of really bad google fonts but mostly stay away from defont yeah and to add to that what i what i've been doing is that every type of font um family has a story behind so, you know, you can use a sans serif or a serif that has some type of design in it that, I don't know, it has like Taiwanese, I don't know, like uh, yeah. styling to it. And maybe you're designing a website for a Asian restaurant. So having that history behind the typefaces that you use now it's not it doesn't only make sense for the design itself obviously you have to also look at everything that Devin just said but it's important because the the moment that you come with a branding project and you present it to your client you can tell them the story on why you cho you chose that typeface and yeah. it's not just like because i liked it and i mentioned this earlier but most type foundries will also have um a specimen book or a specimen site and what that means is basically the font that they or the typeface, whatever you want to be pretentious about it. Uh, whatever they made, they create like a little microsite to show you how to sort of experience that typeface, how they imagined it being used. And it's just a perfect example of um, what they think the sizes should be, what they think the line heights should be, and the font weights. And they give you like some examples of uh, color sometimes too. I think Gorilla Type is a really great type foundry. Uh, Gorilla Type and Pangram Pangram are really awesome. They both have little specimen sites to show you uh, how to use them. I think even on a couple of different sections, they talk about what you should pair them with. I think Pangram Pangram more recently has also gotten into uh, alternatives, Google font alternatives for their fonts, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I took a course on awards not long ago. It's from an agency and I forgot which one it was about uh, typography and it's super interesting. And if you guys admire any designer that creates typography, that's not Powell. <laughs> um, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> yikes. Uh, but I mean, it is what it is. But if you have anybody that you admire, you can drop it on the comments or on the Slack channel and maybe we can invite them because type typography is such an interesting topic. Yeah, I'm actually putting uh, a couple links in the in the chat. Um, these are great smaller font makers. Some is good for uh, inspiration. I'm a big fan of all of these things. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, thank you, Michael. Say, uh, go ahead. Hey, Devin, this this was great. I gotta go. Um, but to add to that typography. There are two people that I really follow a lot. Uh, one of them goes back, because everybody who knows me, I've been here. Uh, my background is in print design. Oh, so cool. I, I worked with uh, Hoffler & Co. Back Mad with, respect. Uh, Vi yeah, with Vi uh, Vibe Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and ESPN Magazine. Yeah. And another designer that he does a lot of app uh, design and he does a web design is Eric Kennedy. Yeah. He's the founder yeah. of learning design. Learning I follow UI both of them. Design. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I'm glad yeah. you I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, this was this was great. Yeah, we loved it. It was really great. I I actually learned a lot and realized that I've been Bye, using guys. Figma wrong my whole life. Bye, Ivan. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I, I mean, to... it's not like I don't know, but you know, when you know hotkeys and stuff like that, and the way you use it is very interesting. Um, I wanted to get into like groups versus sections versus frames uh, versus oh, auto yeah. layout, but I kind of ran out of time on like the actual presentation aspect, but I'm happy to talk about it if anybody's confused. I just didn't want this to be like an intro to Figma. It was more like moving fast in Figma with you know, hard constraints. I think the going back to like how Figma works, it would have been like super accurate to be honest, because uh, what you just shared, come on, like literally the only thing I knew how to use it was the command uh, click, but I clicked mm -hmm. to everything, you know, and it's like, okay, what? I've been using this terribly. I I really truly think that my, my most used hotkeys, um, Honestly, the hardest hotkeys to remember, by the way, are the the ones in the example for increasing font weight and font size. I, they're they're like a such a weird combination. But the ones that I truly use the most are like just traversing through the layers, going down a layer, jumping up layers, and then selecting different ones and being being able to choose the selection colors to, um, you know, pick certain elements within that without having to actually click on them. I think it's like my most used most powerful one so i quickly change things for clients like literally on a call right like i don't have to go oh let me consider it and get back to you i just go okay let's let's change that really quick anybody anybody else has comments questions you guys can mute yourselves okay now. guys what else <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm trying to be quiet because my my friend is doing a work call and I'm here sitting with her. So I'm trying for people to yeah. talk. So cover me, guys. I could hear her laugh. I'm on the same page. My brother is right here speaking as well. So I got to speak like super slow. I'm sorry, uh, low and mute myself like super quick. So <laughs> help me out, guys. Maria, unmute yourself. What do you think? I, I want more. This is. You know, the, I love the flow party because I, I don't know if uh, uh, if people hang around the Slack channel. There, there's these impromptu um, mentoring sessions. For instance, uh, yesterday we had one with Diego it was amazing, and Devin is always there helping us too. And each time I see the, I see what Devin does and how he explains it. These guys are such a great teachers. That Devin, I want more. I need uh, now. You showed us. Now I want um, a build where you show us all the shortcuts in action and how to layout in action. I'm yeah, sorry yeah. to ask. <laughs> you know what's you know what's um, funny is that uh, I mentioned earlier in the presentation I quit my job in, in December to pursue <laughs> freelance and web design full time. I, I actually quit my job, and the reason I gave. Um, they're not in here, so I'll just say. <laughs> the, I actually quit my job because um, I wanted to teach designers and like no code builders how to get better at, at their craft. Like I wanted to create like a paid mentorship service. Um, I, and I think I kind of went off the beaten path and ended up doing like a little bit of an agency thing. But um, yeah, so you, you know, you're not far off, Maria. Yeah, because uh, I've been spending money on, money on courses. And for instance, with just a little bit of free time from Maria the first, about 10 hours, uh, mm -hmm. she taught me much more than uh, I could, I, I had ever uh, learned from courses, right? So I guess uh, mentorship on design, it would be something really useful. Uh, and I think you, you really, really have the talent for it. Yeah, and I and I I've offered it to people in Slack before, but I'm you know I'm offering it again if you if you have like some sort of design or something and and you want me to take a look at it and you're looking for a critique or fact, like I'm happy to just uh, do that. Um, I have I have used you, Devin. I don't, I don't. You know, I'm not like I'm not like you know your friend who um is like I love it. Like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna critique the shit out of it. Like I'm a harsh critic. 
I'm not saying I'm That's the best amazing. designer, but I know what's good and what's not good. And okay. I'm gonna get you. But the, as somebody who's gotten the Devin beatdown on a design. That's what I like to call it. It, it. No, it's very, very helpful though. Like he's very, very helpful. Definitely reach out to Devin. Yeah. Um, Anna asks, what resources would you recommend to start learning Figma? I don't. Super truly, fast. <laughs> I don't, I don't truly feel qualified to answer that. Um, I don't, I'll say what I don't recommend. Uh, boot camps. I can't recommend those. Um, boot camps are taught by designers and developers who aren't in the industry and haven't been for a while. And, um, it's a, it's a money grift. If you've taken one and you got something out of it, that's great. You know, good for you. Um, I just can't recommend them. So maybe flux Academy. I've heard is pretty good. Um, I think that Figma's tutorials are fine. They have a couple of files. I, don't know. I, I, I yeah. feel like every time Figma's um, education tutorials are not great. I never yeah. find the answer. I think that we'll, the... we'll look, we'll look, uh, Anna, and we'll share them on Slack if you're there. We'll share them later. Yeah. Uh, we'll ask around. Yeah. Or if you have questions, like just shoot me a message. Like I, I'm on Slack, I'm terminally online. Um, I'll answer the question at any time of the day. Like, I think another thing too is that um, Figma is such a, it's a, it's not that complex to use and it's quite simple to learn. I think the thing is learning what's right and what's wrong and then applying the design rules to that is the most important part. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, what Evan said. Process, the, uh, I think what's difficult is that the, um, the trouble I had, for instance, learning Webflow, was that I understood everything, but the process of thought about uh, the build, it's different than what you can learn. You can have several concepts. And I think with Figma design is the same. You can just uh, know all the, all the rules, right? But yeah. the process behind designing something, how the mind works, is that what makes uh, designers great, right? It's like, yeah. And that's, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, yeah, I agree. I fully yeah. agree with you. And a way to, to, to uh, because uh, one thing that you do, and you do it quite well, is that the way you criticize people's projects, you, you do it, you're harsh because you're, um, uh, you're sticking to the truth. But you always make, uh, make us understand why that is wrong and how that should be better, right? So I think it's a fast yeah. learning curve. It's very hands-on and yeah, it's amazing. I think my problem with a lot of the tutorials online, um, and this applies to like dev uh, examples too, is that they teach you how to build something highly specific. And I think most most designers, they, they might have something in mind that they wanna make, but you're asking them to make an email app. You're asking them to make a, a landing page for a, I don't know, a weather app or something, you know, something really boring and highly specific. And they're like, they're just looking to to learn some of the rules and some of the things they should or should not do. And, and again, how to move faster. Now, they're not looking to make exactly what you're making. And, and the problem is that, you know, those, those are the types of courses that get a lot of people and they charge lots of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, mentorship with follow alongs. I think it's, um, yeah. it's an amazing idea because I like, think it's more have... powerful yeah. than the course. Yeah. And it's uh, and it's uh, at the end, it's cheaper because it's more effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I love mentorship. I used to go to mentorship nights in San Francisco and like do like a round robin style. Like people go around and ask questions. My only issue is that like you know, I can't live off of that, so I can only dedicate so much time to that. No, but paid mentorship, Diego. Paid hours. It, yeah, but. Um, the people that you I mean, want to mentor does, don't yeah. have that money. Yeah. That's another issue. Yeah. Uh, but it, maybe, if, or yes, but you have been in the space to know what's good, right? And yeah. only after you start doing courses and something and getting to know everyone is that you find out. Because now, yeah. if, if it was now and I hadn't bought 
uh, the courses I did, I would definitely pay for it. But if I count the amount of money I've already spent, I would give it all to you and it could be much better. My God, Maria. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Did you see? Did you see my? Uh, I was writing the love letters, Devin, through my photos, and you didn't read them. Wait, <laughs> your Maria's new obsession. <laughs> Stop! Not in the crowd. Oh, oh my God, that is so ASMR. You can no, do it like it's great. Anyone that that's at the party knows that. Um, what the Devin, the Devin does for us, and sometimes just reach out to these amazing people that are willing to help. Sometimes you think, oh, they are so good, they are so amazing, they are so big thanks to you, Melissa, because indeed it's difficult to find someone uh, so young that managed to change so many lives. What you've built yeah. and the kind of people you attract to this community, yeah. in fact, make our lives better. It's just you see these stars in the space and you just reach out to them and they know you and they help you. And well, so I'll make, hey, I'll make, um, I'll make a poster to you next. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Oh, so, so after this, you're going to the branding thing. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to Christine, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but, um, in, 20 minutes i think brandon is still in here he's muted he's probably not able to say anymore me and brandon are going to hop on josh lowe's new live stream lo-fi studios and uh brandon's going to brand me live how fun and that one's going to be not a presentation it's going to be way more chill it's just going to be him and me shooting the shit talking about design and him oh, showing me nice. how to brand things because um I might be good at, uh, you know, Figma or product design or web design, but man, I cannot make a logo for shit. Oh, can you watch it here live? In Butter? Well, we can yeah. all go over there. Well, I got to be there, oh, so I can't be here. Yes, but no, in but the after party, us. we can all watch it together. Yeah. 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 Right? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So Christine asked, am I self-taught or did I go to design school? A bit of both. I went to... I went to design school for one and a half years, maybe two years, something like that. My first semester was spent in um, special effects and compositing. And then I realized that I actually really hated uh, 3D. And it was a lot of um, like practical uh, practical skills, like charcoal drawing and oil painting and things like that. And I was like, this sucks. I don't, I don't want to do this. So I switched, did that for, I think, a year and a half. To, it was called New Media Web Design at the time. Product designers as a title didn't even exist yet. And then um, I dropped out and I don't have like a cool story. I'm like, I dropped out and I just made it. Like I actually dropped out <laughs> because I forgot to re-register for the next semester. And it was in San Francisco and I'm originally from Arizona. And I was like, oh shit, like it's too late. So I spent a, I spent a semester not at school. I worked at Kohl's as a sales associate oh. folding clothes in the baby section my, <laughs> with like in like dress shoes. And I reached a point where I was like, man, this fucking sucks. Like my feet hurt and my back hurt. Like, I, I'm like 20 years old. I want to, I want to like, like minus $300 on my yeah. account. This like sucks. I got, when I got my first check, it was like $120. And I was like, I can't live on this. <laughs> like, so I, decided to pursue design and development full time. And I knew that there was a lot of money in development and it was easier at the time than it is now. It was less complex. So I, I learned on teamtreehouse.com. I don't know if they're still around and a, a mix of that and code Academy. And, um, I got my first job as a developer slash designer for, for a tiling company working on their wow. e-commerce site, which used big commerce. It was awful. Okay. Um, and then I finally, uh, I finally got connected with this, this one guy who worked for the first agency I was at and I was like, hire me, like hire me, hire me. And he was like, oh, yeah, like we don't have it. In, we don't have the budget yet. And I was like, as soon as you get the budget, hire me, like, I'll show you how good I can be. And so, you know, they finally hired me and I was able to move out to San Francisco. They, uh, one little addition to that, they gave me a $10,000 signing bonus. And I was like, this is the most money I have ever seen in my whole life. And they're like, this is for moving to San Francisco. 
and um, I bought a MacBook and I bought a PS4 and I bought some clothes. I'm into fashion. Um, and I, I blew a lot of that money very quickly. And then I was like, oh, shit, San Francisco is really expensive. And I had Oof. to save up um, again to, to get an apartment. So, wow. uh, yeah. So whatever, yeah. huh? 